And yes, she drew a conclusion, I think. Well, vive la, vive la République, vive la France. <laughs> vive la République, vive la France. <laughs> France is America's oldest ally. And like any relationship that lasts over 200 years, there's going to be some ups and downs. And sometimes it can even lead to divorce. After French teacher Samuel Paty was decapitated by an Islamist terrorist, there has been considerable tension between French intellectual and politicians with American journalists over their coverage of these debates. The French accuse the Americans of victim blaming and of failing to understand the issues at stake, while the Americans criticize the French for failing to discuss the impact of racism on radicalization. To cover this debate, we are exceptionally lucky to have two French journalists with considerable experience of the Anglo American world. Anne Elisabeth Moutet is a French journalist who has worked most of her career in the Anglosphere for the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Times as a columnist. She also writes regularly for CapEx and Unheard and many other publications. And Elizabeth is familiar with the United States. She writes often for the New York Post, has family stateside and has lived there herself. Anis Poirier is a French journalist for L'Express and also an essayist. She has considerable experience in the Anglosphere as well and is a regular for The Guardian, The Observer and The Times. She also recently published two great books about Paris, Notre Dame, The Soul of France, and also Left Bank Art, Passion and the Rebirth of Paris, 1940-1950. Just to get starting, started, Agnès, you were talking the other day on France Culture with two American correspondents in Paris, both James McCauley from the Washington Post and Adam Nosseter, from the New York Times on this divorce between the Anglo world and France on the issue of laicite, of Islamism, of terrorism. And at some point, Nosseter started saying that the tradition of cartoons, political cartoons and caricatures, was a, was a terrible tradition. And he started comparing it, comparing Charlie Hebdo's cartoons with the cartoons you would see under the Vichy regime on Jews. He also argues that French Muslims have a right not to suffer in silence. So the question is, how did we end up in a situation where a foreign correspondent from a very prestigious newspaper ends up de facto legitimizing the stuff you'd expect to hear from someone, someone like Erdogan, where he's equating French Muslims from, with pre-Holocaust European Jews? How did we end up in this situation? Well, um, I have no idea, but it's extremely scary and uh, and and really frightening because if you think about Adam Nasseter is not just starting in the business he's actually the son of a very highly regarded uh, correspondent for I think the Washington Post um, or, or the, yes the Washington Post at the time and he himself um, in his early 60s he was a um, correspondent in East Africa and uh, uh, based in Paris in for the last few years and uh, about to uh, uh, start uh, in Afghanistan. So we're talking about somebody who is uh, highly educated, um, highly competent in many, many ways. And how could he, how could he actually put on the same um, on the same page the, the caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad by Charlie Hebdo and um, the anti-Semitic drawings uh, of uh, uh, Vichy France in 1941 or 1942. Um, it is intellectually dishonest. Um, it is a historical uh, um, uh, mistake, gross mistake, and and it says it speaks volume about the terrible misunderstanding um, that of today uh, regarding uh, the French fight against radical Islam or Islamism, um, and uh, uh, and the deep misunderstanding about laicite, which is. Uh, for um, better or worse, uh, translated uh, into English as secularism, but really we should stick to laicity because it's a, it's another of those French exceptions of which we are very proud. 
but we it seems that we need to um, explain and explain and explain all the time what it is. And thanks for doing it. And Elizabeth, do you have any uh, reactions? Yes, first of all, I think what Adam Mosseter did was even worse than what Agnès says, because it's not just anti-Semitic cartoons under the occupation. What he was talking about was the Berlitz exhibition in 41-42 at the Palais Berlitz, uh, 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 an Art Deco building where the Berlitz language school was installed and who'd been expropriated because it belonged to Jews. And in that thing, the Vichy government, under orders from the Germans, Paris being completely directly occupied, not with the proxy of the Vichy government in southern France, and the Nazi administration organized a, a campaign which is essentially destined to terrify those French people who didn't know enough about anti-Semitism in favor with uh, explaining, it was very didactic, it explained what Jews were and how they were controlling minds and how they were controlling money and how they were swarming like rats. There were little movies. It was very modern. Uh, you saw all those rats sort of uh, as if they were going onto a plague ship and that's what they were doing to France. And it had drawings, but it also had lists of names and pictures and those ghastly drawings with you know, hooked noses. And Adam Nossiter knows exactly what he's talking about because he, re- he wrote a book, which I have not read, about uh, uh, the Second World War in France. And I suspect it's one of those sub- Robert Paxton books that explain that the French behaved badly. Lots of French behaved badly, but not all of them during the war. But And I haven't read it. But suddenly this is somebody who's in his late 40s or 50s. This is somebody who has embraced suddenly the new woke ideology in which you accuse people of something that is not discutable. He, you know, he reached the Godwin point and then went further. And the fact that this can go on on a French cultural channel, which is the French equivalent of Radio 3, is, to my mind, mind-blowing. And the, the level of the attacks that are currently being le- uh, uh, thrown at France by people from prestigious media, the Financial Times correspondent in Brussels, for instance, is making a habit of this, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker now. And all of this is a kind of concerted attack in which uh, useful idiots, and the most useful idiots are people who are actually very intelligent and don't realize what they're doing, and people who are quite sincere are attacking us so that when we're talking now, we say, oh, we have to explain again what laicite, French secularism is. And to be honest, French secularism uh, first of all, we should not have to explain it because it seems with these in these people's minds that whenever uh, uh, you know any culture is all right, but not France. So any culture is all right except the ones they've decided to demonize. And if you know the word Orwellian is very often bad, badly used, but this is really the example, the the type uh, of Orwellian conduct that you you read about in 1984. Uh, it's it is quite extraordinary and and it's dangerous there's one point um about caricatures i think it's important it's important that a lot um you know james mccauley or adam nossiter since we talked about them um and i was on this uh, program for for uh, france culture um that's all they talked about the caricatures but frankly the caricatures are just a pretext um it is the reason why the Charlie Hebdo journalists uh, were gunned down and, and uh, murdered. But it's not the reason why Catholics are, um, you know, uh, uh, assassinated uh, in uh, the Basilica of Nice, for instance, a few weeks um, ago. It's not the reason why uh, Jews, French Jews, were uh, massacred in that um, supermarket. It's not the reason why um, French people who uh, went uh, in Nice again to uh, um, just celebrate Bastille Day were, were um, uh, murdered uh, in, in their dozens. It's it's just a pretext. Um, so going on about caricatures, I think it's is really um, being really lazy, intellectually extremely lazy. Um, also, what they don't seem to understand, but it's it's um, it's difficult. Uh, um, to uh, to think that they might not understand this if uh, they know Charlie Hebdo, which they must uh, know because they are Paris correspondents, uh, they should know that Charlie Hebdo 
aim at every idea, every religion. Uh, the favorite um, target is usually Catholicism and not Islam, uh, Judaism, uh, but every single dogma, if you'd like. Uh, and that's really perhaps the specificity of French satire, um, which is quite um, in your face, quite um, can be quite violent in tone, but we're talking about drawings <laughs> um, as much as a drawing can be uh, offensive. And, and we have a long history um, of uh, political satire in France, but so, so does Britain, for instance, if you think about um, all their drawings against Napoleon. Uh, they were fierce. Um, so, so I think this is you know, so, so lazy, so dishonest to talk about caricatures today in 2020, because this is not uh, what, uh, you know, terrorists uh, and Islamists have a problem with. Um, well, several things. Uh, I'm, I'm entirely with, with Agnès about caricatures and, you know, have these people never seen a Gilray caricature? Uh, and there's a robust tradition of, of extremely brutal caricatures, both in France and in England. Um, the caricatures against Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had consequences, talking about, you know, chopping people's heads off after you've seen caricatures. Uh, this has happened before in our history. Um, but uh, that's one thing. The other thing, if we're talking about Charlie, is that Charlie has to be read uh, at so many different levels that actually I find even most correspondents in Paris do not understand Charlie. Charlie, uh, I mean, it really plays on, on several decades of French political experience, which is why they could draw a caricature of the French justice minister under François Hollande, who's a black woman, Christiane Taubira, and a quite radical one in many ways. Uh, and Christiane Taubira, of course, uh, it, they were they showed her as as a monkey, and that was how she was described by the National Rally, the Marine Le Pen outfit. And so they used this as a caricature, and people said, "Look at these horrible racists, French racists." But what they were doing were, you know, to show what she was like in the eyes of the racists. And uh, Christiane Taubira attended the funeral of Tignus, one of the slain cartoonists. So she herself, being French, absolutely got the point and was very much in favor of it. And that's just one example. And I might also say that my Catholic friends really dislike Charlie Hebdo's caricatures because they're not like those of the Prophet Muhammad, which are pretty, uh, pretty mild. Uh, you have obscene poses, and all of this is part of a kind of Rabelaisian tradition in France about sex. And, and, and how do you insult people except that way? But again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an acquired taste. You don't have to like it. You just don't have to read it. It is not compulsory. It is very, it is very typically French. And most people in France, and I would say really, apart from uh, uh, people who've been as President Macron says, uh, bred into such separatism, they don't understand the difference. Um, uh, the immense majority of the French understand how this. Well, works. this is this is super uh, useful. Uh, the the issues that you both are, are bringing up, and I, I wonder. I mean, some of the examples that you've just uh, laid out, and Elizabeth, really go to show that the issue here isn't so much a sort of, you know, an, an, a sort of a an asymmetry of information where you have these foreign correspondents that are just not up to date with the way that France functions as a society. These are people that are uh, highly educated. They understand, they've been around for a while. They understand uh, the kind of stuff they're putting on paper and with the effect that, that is going to have on their domestic, largely domestic audiences. So I, I, I wonder if we can uh, maybe try to delve a little deeper into what is driving these people. And I want to ask you both, um, you know, as, as, as we were kind of uh, explaining and uh, just just uh, before going going live, um, our whole purpose with this episode and the reason that we're very happy to have you both you know, reputable writers who publish in a number of, of uh, English-speaking outlets and who do the hard work of trying to explain France is because we are trying to give folks a different alternative, that, uh, an alternative narrative that we think is simply non-existing at the moment uh, for U.S. audiences, maybe to a lesser extent British audiences as well. But in order to do that, it would seem as though, you know, you have to focus on some of the specific cases of where these correspondents have um, gone uh, awry, right? Where they've really, really messed up. And I, I want to focus on, on maybe a couple of specific cases. I, I'm sure that you, uh, I mean, you've mentioned Adam Nosseter. There's uh, plenty more, I'm sure. Um, but I, I was thinking of one as you were uh, uh, going on with uh, with your answer, uh, Anne-Elisabeth. 
Uh, you had, um, you had, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Karen Atia, I, I wonder kind of who, how you uh, pronounce his name, but she had a bogus story about how France was arguably uh, ID numbering Muslims exclusively in a way that you would expect, uh, like Francois said, uh, Vichy France to do, or in a way that you would expect China to do. And it, t it only takes a quick Google search to realize what the truth is and that this was entirely bogus, right? France ID numbers, I think in this specific instance, it was uh, home school children, right? And, and she still went ahead and as a professional journalist, she didn't seem to have a second thought, right? A sort of a professional uh, fortitude to kind of uh, double check what she was writing about. And then there's also the Ben Smith story. Maybe we can get into some of that later. But, um, you know, what do you, what do you think these people are driven by? Are they just you know, woke and driven by ideology? Do they genuinely not understand France? Uh, like, what do you think these people, what do you think drives them? Uh, maybe we'll start with Agnes and then we'll turn back to when Elizabeth. The question you asked about journalists like Adam Mossiter or Karen Atia. Karen Atia, if I get this correctly, is the uh, international comment editor of the Washington Post and she's youngish. Uh, and Adam Mossiter is a bit different because he's got a certain age. James McCauley is probably 30 years old. I have No, been... no, no. Adam Nosita is 60. Yeah, I'm talking about James McCauley here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, right. Yes, <laughs> early 30s. Early 30s, early 30s yeah. Thirties. And uh, what I think is there's a combination, and in the case of Adam Nosita, that must be, that must exist in itself. It's a combination of trying to keep your job at a place where thought crime is not being punished, now being punished by being bullied out. Uh, uh, there's one... Um, a journalist, opinion journalist, who's mildly conservative, Barry Weiss, who was hired to bring to comment at the New York Times a slightly different voice, and she was first bullied on the intranet of the New York Times, and eventually she was she was pushed out. And I think there are lots of journalists at the New York Times, and I will not name names, who are basically holding their heads under the parapet in a kind of sort of Selenian era type with a minus the gulag. But because you get fired if you if you if you do not go with the way. And also because New York head office, Washington, they're asking for those stories and they want those stories and that narrative. And I think there's an element for the younger ones, but for everyone, is that they are all living in an echo chamber. And the echo chamber holds those truths to be self-evident that the French are racist and that everybody actually white is racist and and all sorts of things. I mean, it's really as if they would never, you know, they don't they don't hear anything else. Uh, it's not new. If you remember Pauline Kael, the wonderful film critic of The New Yorker, saying in 1972 that she didn't know anyone who voted for Nixon, and still Nixon won the, 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 the nation as a landslide, 49 states out of 50, I think. So this is not new, but the echo chamber in America right now, and America is a very efficient country, and the entire education system has been changed uh, from uh, kindergarten to universities in the past 20 years, and the children are absolutely taught, they're very socialized, American children at school, much more than European children, and you come out with extremely helpful, nice young people who may not be academically absolutely sound, but certainly they know how to work together, and then you, you send the ones sums to college, and then they get a brilliant education. But now, what they are educated in is a number of dogmas, and the dogmas are presented as truth. And critical thought is impossible because you get bad marks. And at every level, and there are French students who go to America, and they say, I wrote this, and I was told by my tutor that if I don't amend it, I would have a bad mark. So it's very easy to train people into the kind of thought in which you do not you, not only do you not look outside, but if you look outside, you know that you get punished. And uh, it's this combination of laziness and, and propaganda, I think, that gives this effect. Yeah. And, and this is, um, uh, unless uh, Agnes maybe wants to jump in and feel free to do so. Uh, but I, I wonder, this is all super helpful. And I think we're really getting into the heart of, of uh, what it is that people need to hear, right? I mean, um, you're just, you're essentially walking people through you know, how wokeism can have this corrosive, corrosive effect in, um, I mean, we mostly hear about, you know, universities and whatnot, but in the case of uh, newsrooms, as, as Anita any was, was explaining, this is also the case. And it, it really uh, helps to see how, and, and I think you can bring a lot of experience to, to explaining this, how these stories are filed, right? How the uh, news, how the main sort of um, headquarters of the newsroom back in, in the States gets to ask for stories, how those get filed and how, this is all kind of a game of, 
incentives where, you know, the, by filing the, the right stories, you can sort of, uh, you know, uh, build up a name. Uh, and and, um, and I, wonder, I wonder if there's anything more to it. I mean, there's another issue that we wanted to bring up with the both of you, uh, which is uh, Ben Smith's uh, column. And I believe it was the New York Times. And this was, I forget when exactly this was, but th there was a whole um, story around uh, his uh, kind of, uh, squabble with with the Elise, where um, apparently the way he told the story, and maybe you can also each each of you can walk us through how you lived it, what you know about it. I know your your colleague at the Express, um, Marion Rentergem, was was um, was writing about this in detail. But apparently, he um, misconstrued the way that that this thing went about, which from a journalistic uh, standpoint is is profoundly um, unethical, right? He he said that you know. Uh, that um, what, what was it? He had tried to no. Uh, Macron had had called the Times for an interview when it was the other the other way around. Um, so I, I guess it, it seems as though journal journalists are going into their job reporting on France with preconceived notions of what it is they have to say and write. And um, can, can we? Sorry, before we we go to that, I. I can take that one uh, and talk about that, the Ben Smith, because it's a, it's really a, a school case. Um, I remember very well I was in Paris when that piece by Ben Smith in the New York Times came out. And I it was early in the morning. I switched on uh, French, uh, France Culture, uh, the equivalent of BBC Radio 3 or Radio 4. And... Um, it was the international press review in which uh, the French journalists had taken it, uh, taken the article as at face value like the rest of us because it's the New York Times and you don't doubt um, or at least you didn't use to uh, uh, doubt what was written there. And so um, I thought how odd that President Macron and how clumsy of his of him to call a journalist from the New York Times. It's not going to go down well, and it's actually that was a, a stupid thing to do. Um, and that's that was exactly what uh, the French public broadcaster was alluding to. And this is that was the moon music in France and obviously abroad for what. Two days until somebody from a journalist from L'Opinion, um, uh, then relayed by uh, Marion van Rettergem from L'Express, um, actually got the facts right. And what happened exactly was Ben Smith had been calling the Elise Palace a few times over the last few weeks to get an interview. And the, the French president doesn't give an interview that easily, uh, and he wasn't going to. Uh, but because the, the subject of laicity um, was becoming so uh, um, so difficult to explain, and also there was this. Remember that ban of French products and uh, the Turkish leader and the Afghan uh, um, Pakistan leader uh, just piling on 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 France and President Macron. Uh, he relented um, to give a ten minute interview um, that was asked by Ben Smith. And um, but when you read the article, you have the feeling that um, not only did the French president call him and um, call the, the the New York Times journalist and shouted at him, um, and uh, when it was the the complete opposite. Um, and therefore, uh, President Macron was described as Trumpian. I think that was the uh, the term. Um, so, so well, when you realize this, then you think, okay, well, I'm not going to read the New York Times with the same eyes. Um, I'm going to have to start doubting what I read in the New York Times. I'm going to have to check who is writing what. Um, and this is so bad for everyone, you know. Um, and so it means, as you rightly say, that on certain subjects, 
the um, journalists are not doing their job anymore. They are not being as impartial as they should be, and they already have an opinion on the subject they are going to report on. And they are twisting the facts. With you, to have an opinion is fine in the sense in the sense that even journalists, you know, have opinions. They are trying to go against their opinion, especially if they are reporting. In opinion pages, it's another story. They can have an opinion and argue uh, and make a case for that opinion. But uh, when the two of them collide, then uh, it leads to confusion um, and to uh, uh, to a completely distorted uh, view of of reality. Uh, and then suddenly the idea, and I remember looking at Twitter and seeing, um, you know, very well-respected British politician with, I, I don't know, 400,000 followers, Rory Stewart, uh, former um, uh, Tory uh, uh, MP, who um, tweeted that article by Ben Smith saying, oh, this is really not a good move by President Macron. Um, and this is how fake news uh, are uh, spreading like wildfire. But, you know, when it comes from the New York Times or the Washington Post or the New Yorker, you think um, this is very, very dangerous. Well, first of all, everything that Agnès says is absolutely true. Uh, and, you know, uh, when people say Macron is the president against the media, media like Donald Trump, this is a president who, if anything, gives too many interviews. He went to Al Jazeera, uh, the Qatari cha channel, uh, to explain French policies for, for uh, over an hour. So, you, we're not talking about the same character, and I'm not especially uh, in favour of everything he does, but Seriously, that is complete madness. Um, I think uh, we, we, we have uh, several problems on, on, on this, which is that uh, we are in a postmodernist, deconstructivist uh, era in that we have people who've been uh, listening to American interpretations of French philosophers, and uh, they've put it on steroids, basically, is truth does not exist, objectivity doesn't exist, it's all relative, it's all about your experience, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful system, because it's a system that's circular, your experience mediates everything, and your experience, of course, is your truth. And it's victimization. And all of this is a potent, noxious brew, uh, which uh, uh, helps them sort of, they approach things and they have a whole uh, lens through which to approach things. And like all those systems, it is extremely comfortable. Yeah, you can explain absolutely everything. And, and truth is actually messy, complicated, sometimes illogical, difficult, and nourished, we hope, on facts. But uh, this, is, this is outside the realm of fact. Uh, Americans, it's very interesting that Americans who used to be so obsessed with fact-checking, I've, I've written for American newspapers and magazines, and the fact-checkers would spend more time on the telephone with you than uh, before the internet, than, uh, than they would, you spend time sometimes writing the piece, and they checked everything, including things that your, your interviewee had said. And then suddenly they go into this in which they don't check anything anymore because it is revealed truth. And, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that may go worse before it gets better. But I would like also to say one thing. Uh, I don't know whether you've paid attention to a really important vote at the University of Cambridge uh, a few days ago, which is that by a wide majority, 1,300 something people against 161 people, uh, academics in, at Cambridge, uh, they voted against a motion that would require respect uh, of people whose opinion are different from yours, uh, 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 rather than tolerance. And honestly, I have no respect for anti-vaxxers. I have no respect for all sorts of opinions. And the fact that you have this chilling effect that was a possibility in the mind of the very vocal members of the work uh, uh, sort of cadre uh, uh, blinds us. And very often for all sorts of these people, it blinds us to the fact that they are a small minority. They are possibly 10 percent, 15 percent of public opinion, but 15 percent really uh, if they're lucky, but most of the time, they, they, but it's enough. If you if you break down enough stuff, if you dump enough statues in Bristol Harbour, if you shout, if you start sending your troops on Twitter, your followers, to harass and harry people, you can make their lives hell. Uh, 
Uh, and you can terrify people. And as I said, in some systems, you can get people to lose their jobs. You can get the th children threatened. All of those are examples that happened. If you, you and. Uh, what I do not understand is the people in power, such as the editor of the New York Times, who absolutely caved in, in the case of Barry Weiss, or uh, uh, that uh, bosses in American companies yield to those people because they're afraid of the image problem. But these people are a small minority, and pushback is possible. Cambridge, because it was a secret vote and not raised hands, uh, which in itself is very reminiscent of how, for instance, the communists took over French, a large French union in the 50s. You know, you have a raised hand vote and people are afraid. Uh, but if you have a secret vote, you realize that these people are a minority and we can push back and we ought to push back all the time. And how they demonize people is saying they are racist, they are fascist, they are reactionary, we put them in a box, we insult them, we say they are Trump. Uh, the French, right now France has a, 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 a horse in the race on Brexit and they've decided to be hardline on Brexit. And so Boris Johnson is Trump. I'm not holding a brief for Boris Johnson. I'm just saying he is not Trump. I would like to see, I would like to see Donald Trump sort of recite the first uh, stanza of of the Iliad in ancient Greek, and I don't think, you know, honestly, I don't think he can read it in English. Uh, but uh, it is very useful because you have a shorthand. And again, we are talking about the two minutes hate. We are talking about 1984. These are techniques that George Orwell did not invent. He looked at them in Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany, and he, he put them into his novel 1984, which was not a science fiction novel. It was a political satire in the, in the spirit of Swift. And I really think that uh, this is how we have to push back, is to look at how they structure this, how they create barriers in ideas, how people in a large publishing house in America, for instance, working for, uh, um, I forget the name, I, I believe I'm trying to think, it's not Penguin, it's a, I mean, it's a really large publishing house, uh, try to prevent them from publishing uh, Wolfgang, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. Jordan, P yes, Jordan. Jordan Peterson is a bestseller, and you have people in the company saying, I feel unsafe if you publish this book. What became of, well, we'll publish it because we're the boss and you're not. Uh, it's, it's, it's this complete sort of craven, terrified attitude that is the most dangerous. It's not the people doing it. We can see what they're like. Is everybody following blindly because they're afraid? And, and, and that's really worrisome. We could we could write an article titled uh, "And is Everton Muti Against the American Media" at I, this point. Uh, there are lots of good American media to do to this day, and good there's very good online publications. There's good old magazines that don't do these things, uh, uh, and but it's pervasive and it will it's it's corrosive, and I think. It will take some it's a magazine like The Atlantic. The Atlantic used to be sort of, you know, it's a really intelligent and thoughtful magazine, and it's now being slightly corroded by this. And, and I worry about this because, quite frankly, I used to subscribe to so many of these magazines, and I paid for them, and I, I stopped my subscription to The New Yorker. Uh, I've stopped my online subscription to The New York Times. Uh, and, and I don't want to do this for The Atlantic, but at one stage I will have to do it too because if they keep doing that. What is terrifying is... Uh, it's the people who want to go along with it. That's that's what scares me. So to come back to the issue of, of France um, and the issues of laicity and the issues, you know, um, putting putting the blame on, on systemic racism and whatnot, there's another thing which I think we kind of overlooked because these people will interview French people for their publications, for their articles. Uh, but there is a frustrating tendency to only people interview people on the far left of the spectrum. So essentially all their interviewees We'll agree that France is, you know, the beyond the pale racist country and that laicity is a thin veil for, for, for racism. And therefore, American readers who, you know, rely on the New York Times or other publications to get an understanding of France have the impression that all the sensible people in France will agree with the New York Times coverage on the idea that France is, is you know, the, uh, that France is this racist country. So... How how do they how how do we make sure these moderate voices don't get squeezed in? And it's not even just you know random random uh, French people you know not you know we could be having more French experts or whatnot, but even you know Muslim figures are getting squeezed out of this. You know, there's there's a um, there's a few articles in op-eds by many Muslim figures and intellectuals who have passionately argued that laicity does protect their freedom of worship, and the people who are criticizing France in that way are actually planting the seeds of religious strife. How do we make sure we 
send this voice out out of France. I'd like to say one thing about this and then up, uh, up to one, yes. Um, the first two things. First of all, laicité, because, you know, what is laicité? And laicité is guaranteeing the neutrality of the public space. And that is something that is not always well understood. And it's got to do with France's history over several centuries. If you take Germany, which is really a democratic country with a thoughtful press, um, Germany has a, a religious tax, which you have to opt out about if you're an atheist. You can be an atheist, but the country provides for this to happen in, in the country. Uh, you've got Britain, which is a democracy and has been for 800 years, and still it's a monarchy with a democratic system, and still uh, it has an established religion and it doesn't bother anyone. Belgium has an established religion. Uh, it's Catholicism in Belgium, it's it's the uh, Church of England in, in Britain, etc. And there's a debate in America which has separation of church and state, but does have mentions of God in 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 the uh, uh, sometimes on the on the banknotes even. Um, um, but the French system is entirely different. Uh, the, the Catholic Church, which was, of course, not only established, but called herself, called France the, the eldest daughter of the church with kings who were anointed uh, in the cathedral at Reims um, in the past eight or 900 years. Uh, that uh, became, came to a halt at the time of the French Revolution. And at the time of the French Revolution, the system in France where, where you had three estates, uh, the aristocracy who was supposed to fight for you but got money for it, uh, the clergy who was supposed to pray for your soul and didn't pay taxes for it, and then you know the great unwashed, the third estate, uh, were all made equal. And the uh, uh, 19th century, which is all about replaying the French Revolution, uh, was sharply divided in France between the church, which was reactionary in the old sense of they wanted to go back to the previous system, the restoration of the monarchy, and you had the Republicans who wanted to go on with the Republic. And that translated in the Third Republic into the establishment of a system in which the church, uh, uh, the, the French have, of course, freedom to, to, of religion, all religions. And um, the idea of laïcité was a way to appease those tensions of, of the 19th century in order to guarantee that every uh, faith could pray freely, and that guarantee is important. We had the walls of religion in France. And then in the, 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 the public space would be neutral, which means that French civil service is neutral, that God has no place in our, in, our, in our mairie and in our palaces of power, and it is entirely separate. But it is supposed to protect Muslims as well. And the whole notion that you, you have to not wear a headscarf uh, in a, in a, if you're a civil servant in France is because you're also not supposed to have a large cross as a civil servant to show it on your, on your, on your the, the jumper. Uh, and uh, if you are a, a, a French school child, if you're a girl, you must not wear a headscarf because you must not obey religious uh, orders separating you from the other kids. And you're, when you're in, in kindergarten, primary school and secondary school, at university, you're a, maj a major, you've reached majority, and then you're allowed to wear a headscarf if you feel like it. But French children are owed a, a neutral education, and that is guaranteed by the French school's curriculum, which even private schools in France follow. They have a contract with the state. And it's very important to understand this. It is not something that came out of the blue, and it's not aimed at something or something else. For, for some time, it was quite aimed at the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church made peace with it and is, 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 is working under it uh, and has no problems with it. Well, as uh, Anne Elizabeth said, the laicity is the result of a long intellectual process, um, crowned, if you'd like, by the 1905 law of separation of church and state. I think what is important is to know that, you know, laicity is not an opinion, but the freedom to have one. It is not a belief. But the principle allowing all beliefs, uh, providing they respect uh, the principles of, of freedom of conscience and equal rights. And it is neither pro nor anti-religious. As uh, Anne Elizabeth said, it is a neutrality. There's also something I think that is not well understood um, because it's a, long, it's a long intellectual process. Um, and it has its roots, you know, in, among others, in, in Voltaire and his long-fought battle against the Catholic Church. Um, 
I, I went back to uh, Jules Michelet um, a few weeks ago. Um, who was this uh, wonderful, very romantic, he had a fantastic style, um, this French historian of the 19th century. And um, I will quote you uh, um, just one sentence which I thought encapsulated so well that spirit. He said, he wrote rather, from Rabelais to Molière, and from Molière to Voltaire springs Gallic frankness, a hatred for all Tartuffe, whether religious, political, or philanthropic. And he also said, you will have to accept this. You cannot take Voltaire out of the French spirit any more than you can take France out of the French. And it is something important. Laïcité is... Um, an emancipation of the citizen. And when we're talking about the school and children until they become adult, until they become 18, um, school is that place where they, they, they are becoming the citizens. Um, they will then choose, you know, to be, uh, if they want to be religious or not, or atheist, that they, they, you know, they can do that. But it's, but it's the, the place where they free themselves from not only their social milieu, but also from their family. And that's a good thing. They can then uh, remain uh, loyal to their family education or, 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 or emancipate from it. But it will be their individual choice. And laïcité, in a way, is so much in our DNA. It's who we have chosen to be as a nation. And uh, there were recent polls saying that 88% of the French people um, were very much attached to that principle, which they understand very well. Um, and uh, because, you know, there's a whole debate about uh, um, open laicity, strict laicity, ferocious laicity. No, there is laicity. Um, and it's a neutrality. And it's a beautiful law. Um, so, um, so I think that's something that it's not well understood. You, you cannot take uh, a Voltaire out of the French more, any more than you can take laïcité out of the French now, 120 years uh, later. So I have um, a bit of a follow-up on this, because what I find interesting is we've had this debate five years ago when there was the tax on Charlie Hebdo. We've had this debate saying, you know, France is a different system, laïcité is not secularism, it's different and whatnot. But what it seems to me is... It, ha it has gotten worse in the past five years because because at least we had, to some extent, a debate in, in American media. Nowadays, it seems like there is a kind of soft consensus of saying, well, it, it's sad for France, but they had it, they had it some, some extent coming with their system. Um, you know, there's very, very basic examples. You know, in, um, last summer, Washington Post recruited as one of its global um, global news, sorry, global opinion uh, editors, it, it recruited Rokaya Diallo. And now, people who are familiar with France, Rokaya Diallo is you know, very much to the, to the far left of the spectrum. Um, she's the one who will be running decolonial, decolonial camps reserved to non-white people to um, make sure they understand how uh, biased society is against people of color and whatnot. Uh, she, she, she is she's very radical. Um, and so how do we go from a situation where there is a debate, a healthy debate in, across across the world of what's going on in France and with, with back and forth and whatnot, to a situation where France's laïcité is uniformly condemned and where, you know, the, the most radical, the only people who have a voice outside of France are the most radical uh, agitators? First of all, uh, the foreign correspondents and interviewing uh, French people want to fill the race, uh, the, 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 the dance card, and they use the race card to fill the dance card, which is that we need to have somebody who's from a minority, we need to have a woman, if possible, it would be nice to have somebody trans, uh, and let's get those people. And they also need, although written press shouldn't, uh, people who speak good English. If you take someone like Rokaya Diallo, she, she, she checks all the, all, the, all the boxes. And in addition to that, she was one of those uh, 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 young people in France uh, picked by this deeply misguided program of the State Department called Young Leaders. 
the State Department, and it doesn't matter who was president, under George W. Bush they were doing it, uh, pick people, and they used to go to the French banlieue, and the American embassy would sort of, you know, send people out, scouts to find people from diversity, because there was this ongoing feeling in the noughties that France was not doing race properly, and America being so successful about race relations, was was going to teach them how to do it. And they went and they picked out all sorts of people and they brought them to America. And I asked someone at State whom I know how it worked. And he explained at great length that they are brought over, their stay is paid for. Sometimes they get uh, 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 bursaries for universities. Uh, and they do not need, in two or three weeks, they do not need a single person in the private sector. They need all sorts of community on organizers and civil servants and think tanks, but private sector per se, they do not need anyone. And it comforts a certain sort of specific bureaucratic view of how things should be like. Uh, and of course, diversity is not lawful. And when I say lawful, I mean legal and obligatory. And and the Rokeya Diallo is one of the uh, results of that. And so her English is good. She looks good, which whenever you need someone on television is very important. Uh, she's outspoken and she gives them exactly the answers they want. Uh, now, again, I'm going to go back to the, uh, the old Soviet press. Uh, Soviet television used in Paris to go and every now and then they would film a, a bread queue in Paris and the bread queue in Paris was in fact in, fa in fact the queue for the Poilane bread score which there's, at the time there was only one in Rue du Cherche Midi and if you wanted to have this massively chic expensive brown bread you would queue for it um, uh, and uh, uh, they, they could tell you know Soviet viewers under Brezhnev that the French were queuing for bread and that's exactly what these journalists are doing they, they, they do the, the Russian bread queue the Soviet bread queue again and they find they they they, they, they pick these people uh, and they go and interview them because they understand them better, because they have no effort to make to understand a French person who's frankly different from them. You've got someone here and uh, you don't have to think. It's a bit like Emily in Paris, you know, the silly season, series in Netflix where you've got this spacey American uh, who gets to Paris and is going to tell the, uh, the French how to do social media. And she does get sort of ridiculed by the French. But the lessons the Americans draw from this is that still, you know, she's right and all those horrible, mean, nasty American French people are wrong. Uh, and what we see now increasingly is we've got those correspondents and they're all Emily in Paris with a meat cleaver. Uh, you know, oh, you chop a teacher's head. Well, no, never mind. You know, all part of the great sort of diversity of life. Uh, and, and it's laziness, but I don't think they even know that it's laziness. It's a cognitive bias. You can fight a cognitive bias, but it takes time and effort because you're so used to seeing something that you don't see something else. You don't see Trump voters, for instance, which is how uh, the pollsters were so wrong about the figures in, in the last election and the previous one. And I think it's it's not they're not doing this so much. In, some of it is not intentional. Some of it is cognitive bias. Uh, yes, I completely agree. I think also there's complete confusion um, of... Um, different things. Um, for instance, that uh, very American expression called systemic racism. So France um, is where uh, this systemic racism is, uh, is, is rife. Okay, so it means that in, in, in their eyes, in the eyes of um, that uh, new American uh, radical left, um, for instance, the Islamist attackers are the victims of our systemic racism. And so they're imposing this narrative, which has nothing to do with terrorism, but with America's obsession with race. And they just, you know, they just apply it on the French situation. So it's not only misleading, but it's completely wrong. So it means that for instance, they see Muslims as a racial, social, and religious minority whose rights are being questioned by uh, the authoritarian President Macron. Um, so for them, it's a question of discrimination, when actually it's a question of religious extremism. And religious extremism, they have very little experience of historically. You know, we've had the wars of religion. Um, but they, they, they didn't, you know, it's in, ingrained in our historical DNA, um, but they don't have that. So there's a complete confusion, and it, it's so, it's, 
again, intellectual uh, dishonesty. Sometimes it's not intentional, um, uh, but it's also, as, as Anne Elizabeth said very rightly, a cognitive bias. And uh, they don't go out of their comfort zone. And as a correspondent, um, you have to go outside of your comfort zone. Imagine, it would be the same as if in my articles for L'Express, trying to explain Britain and trying to explain Brexit, out of eight people I interview for a piece, seven would be hard right Brexit is to explain to me what Brexit is. And just one voice would be slightly more moderate, but not even a remainer. And this is how you build a completely distorted view of the country you're supposed to to uh, um, uh, talk about and write about in an informed way. Um, it's such a sorry sight, but it's also something that we need. Um, to, you know, we've spent too much time, too many years, just um, thinking, oh, this is not, you know, the Americans are being Americans, doesn't matter. We know who we are. Well, now it's taking some proportion that there might be an echo chamber, there might be a small minority, but we now have to speak up. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm so glad you're you're getting into all of that, and yes, uh, it, it seems as though we're we're coming full circle with the conversation. We're, we've got we've got a few minutes left uh, before uh, the, the end of the hour, but I, I was very interested in something that Anne Elizabeth said in her prior uh, response, which is this funny kind of life cycle of wokeism, where you know uh, you were getting earlier into how originally a lot of this sort of woke campus culture that blossoms out of the universities ends up permeating the culture. A lot of it began in the sort of 68er mentality, uh, which had different origins. I mean, America had a 68er mentality uh, of its own, but much of it was imported from France. You could lump the Frankfurt School into that uh, that bucket as well. But it's, it's isn't it funny how um, so all those years later, this campus culture that is metastasized in the U.S. is now coming back to bite France in a way that I wonder if we could get your perspective, because it's it's clear, uh, and we hope it will be clear to, to all of our listeners, that this is the very least creating these sorts of silos of information where uh, the U.S. audience is getting fed, is being fed one side of the story. And we in France are, you know, um, living with what it actually uh, means to be French and what it actually is like to live in France. And these are, you know, entirely irreconcilable narratives. But I wonder to what extent this is this ends up um, polluting France itself and to what extent French people end up buying into this. I mean, I, I think it'd be, it'd be um, dishonest to, to, to say that, um, that this is not having any effect among French people themselves. I mean, you were talking earlier about Bocaya Diallo and a lot of people who seem to be espousing these views and who are less able than they were maybe five or 10 years ago to see race relations, say in France, other than through the prism of oppression and domination. And these ideas are taking hold, um, right? And so I wonder, you know, why is it why is it so hard to have, I mean, we can th think of many examples of this. Laicite is one where we, we haven't seen a sort of forceful, strong response and defense of what the, of what the concept is. Uh, but even just the notion of, of citizenship. I mean, France does not have the intergenerational accumulation of inequalities, segregation, the kind of racial history that the United States has. We, we in France are lucky to have a very colorblind notion of citizenship, uh, right? And that wh wh wherever that comes from, this is the reality of how French people see each other, is, is that it transcends the color of our skin. We, we see through the color of someone's skin. We're, we're able to, to bridge that gap in a way that, the, that our American friends are, are not. So why, why is it so hard to make a positive case um, and, 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 and I guess that kind of goes hand in hand with, um, do, do you see, the, do you see examples in France of, you know, woke people, uh, taking, uh, hold of the culture? Do you see journalists, do you see intellectuals, uh, uh you know, um, exporting this to a French public as well? Oh, yes. God, yes. Lots. Um, First of all, I'd like to, you know, uh, if we go back to 68, 68 was, of course, carried by students in universities. And 68 was the time when they started sending more students to universities. But still, uh, 
you didn't have that many students in universities compared to the mass of students that are sent to universities. And I'd like to take the fascinating modeling of Peter Turchin on this, um, uh, you know, who studies a long, uh, long-term uh, uh, history on demographics uh, and, and, and figures, but over several centuries. Um, we now have over populated universities, even the ones that uh, in America that cost so much that they, uh, they uh, load uh, the students with student debt for half their lives. Uh, and there are no jobs except in the hard sciences that go after this. So having discontent with a population who quite frankly expect not to live very well with a diploma that costs them so much uh, is something or that costs their parents something or uh, just, you know, they're doing this in French universities, which are free. Um, uh, the idea that society is not waiting for them, it makes them angry. And it's understandable, it's just part of the sociology. When you've got over 50% of, of an age class that goes to university fully expecting to have uh, a, an executive salary and not getting it, you are fostering and reproducing every year. Uh, that's just figures. That's, you know, it's got nothing to do with people I, people's ideas. Second, uh, I would say that, yes, you see an, an increase in work attitudes uh, because uh, there are fashions in, in, in ideas. As we know, Marxism was a fashion. Uh, psychoanalysis was a fantastic fashion in the mid-20th century, and now it's really, you know, it's past it. Some good things are fashions. Uh, uh, but it's all a question of sort of bandwagon until everybody on, on which everybody tries to jump. And, and they like it for all sorts of reasons. So there's there's the facility and, and the attractiveness. As I said before, these the attractiveness of ideas that sound so logical and they always there's always an explanation for everything. Uh, and there's also uh, the uh, in America you've got the dictatorship of tenure and you've got uh, all those disciplines that started as perfectly valid disciplines and then decided that victim victimhood was a, a great way of of sort of uh, uh, the leveraging. Your, your discipline. And when you leverage a discipline, you, you get credits and you get more people who get tenure. So all of this is also part of the economics of universities. France is very different. France universities are late to this, but believe me, they're getting there because whenever we say that there's an American or Anglo-Saxon fad uh, that's never going to come to us, uh, it's about to you know, give it five to 10 years and it's here. Uh, and it's, so it's going to happen. But it, it's very interesting that in France, the, the first uh, establishments in which you started seeing uh, the woke uh, ideas were elite. You have OHESS, uh, École des Hautes Études en Études Sociales, Historiques et Sociales, um, Superior Social, uh, you, OHESS, you have um, uh, Sciences Po, you have École Normale Supérieure. These are where the French elite has molded. They're small, uh, usually postgraduate school, and they are immensely powerful. They create networks. And that's where it started because they, were, they knew, they were quite aware that they were being bred to become the elite. And they wanted more than what they felt the modern world was going to give them. And, and it worked very well with them. And also, especially, you, you, you define yourself uh, against something at the same time that you are part of it. And when you come from an elite background, because the uh, social mobility in France has fallen uh, in ways in opposite direction than it has in Britain, for instance, uh, those students, especially the ones who were not students in heart sciences, uh, were prime targets for this kind of ideology and they bought into this. French universities at large are miserable. And when I say miserable, I think of Les Miserables. They are not well funded uh, by the state and they're not very happy. And again, if you're not going into a hard science one, there's not much chance for you to get an uh, opportunity for you to get a new job. And also the teachers are all civil servants because of the centralized ministry of education. When they started 15 years ago, for instance, you know, the Université de Jussieu tried to organize BDS and they were reminded, and especially the, the teachers were reminded, the professor were reminded, by the then education minister, Luc Ferry, who said, look, you know, boycotting a, a, a blanket boycott is illegal and therefore please stop it or your career will suffer. And that was the end of it. Um, and then it came back to other schools in which the dialogue was entirely different, but it took 10 years. Um, and and that's, that's a bit unique. They, it, it gains traction in France for the same reason that it gains traction somewhere else and also because of those social and, and I would say structurally French uh, um, uh, circles, uh, and also because 
uh, all French. France is a, a, a country which finds it very difficult to change, and traditional parties have been slowly falling down and not being very able to get uh, the kind of support uh, uh, that they want to win elections. And so you've got people overtaking them. You had uh, new unions, which more radical, who started overtaking the old style unions uh, 30 years ago, people like Sud and Attac. And, and they thought the old unions, who were partners in, in running the French social model, uh, uh, health system, pension system, were people who were too much entrenched uh, uh, with the establishment. Uh, and, and the whole thing was a kind of kabuki of dance of opposition, but not real opposition. And so those new unions filled a void, so to speak. And in the same way, you've got in parties, you've got parties on the extreme left uh, in, in, in countries like Britain and in America, they are part of the two parties, the two main parties. In France, you've got small parties, but they take over because the, the mainstream have been unable to, to rejuvenate themselves, and, and it's also their fault. And then you need to di differentiate yourself, and those new parties differentiate themselves with something that will gain traction and work. But I will also sort of blame the fact that the French uh, integration model used to be called an assimilation an assimilation model, a model, and that was truly French, and you became French because you aspired to be a French person. And aspiring to be a French person bought, you know, meant uh, essentially buying into the Enlightenment values of the 18th and 19th century and the personality of France in which every French citizen has the same rights and is defined by his Frenchness or her Frenchness, and color is part of the world, you know, the world, the lively tapestry of, 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 of the country itself and, and people who want to be part of it. And if you take people like uh, Michel Poniatowski, the minister, or Cardinal Mazarin, or Marie Curie, uh, they are first French, and then they were uh, Polish uh, or uh, um, uh, Italian. Uh, if you take the best representative, the best hero of you know 20th century uh, character of, of uh, literary endeavor, defining the French with great subtlety, Asterix. Asterix is created by two immigrants, well, the sons of immigrants, Technically, but Albert Uderzo, the draftsman, is an Italian who's, uh, uh, who, who was born in Paris, but his parents came as so his father came as a mason uh, in Paris. Uh, Charlie Hebdo was created by another Italian, François Cavana, who wrote a book about his Italian living in Italian sort of uh, uh, workers. Uh, Thing. Uh, René Goscinny, the writer of, of Asterix, is a, a, a Comfari born in Paris as his Polish Jewish family was on its way to Argentina. Uh, and those people who were educated somewhere else bought so much in, into the French model and the uh, lo lovingly learnt all the quirks and, and characteristics of French society precisely because they came from the outside and they loved it. And this is our assimilation model. It's not unlike the assimilation model of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, but it's something that the identitarians loathe and detest because they want to divide people in ever smaller groups and they each have a grievance and they invented intersectionalism to bring those grievances together where in France we just had nation and it was not grievances it was adhesion so uh, when we decided under François Mitterrand to have uh, um, integration instead of assimilation I think we we, we were grievously betrayed uh, by, by that administration. So because we had just one last question on the security bill in France, which I think is important to mention. The global security law is an own goal by Macron uh, because uh, he has suffered uh, insecurity. He's inherited a situation in which for all sorts of reasons there is unrest in France and violence and it, you know, the, the casseurs, the people who break down everything at the end of demonstrations have existed for 20 years and uh, he has a party of inexperienced MPs and they voted a law which essentially, can, you know, especially in the context of terrorism on another side and also because of social unrest, uh, they voted something which is a monster. Uh, they should not have voted it. There's everything already in, in the code twice over. Uh, and, and that's an admission of weakness. And of course, uh, the uh, foreign observers have bounced on it. But I think it's a bad bill. Uh, Article 24 is disgusting, uh, and um, and it's not the same thing. The thing is, they make mistakes because they're weak. Uh, it's not. It's it's because of stupidity. It is not because of evil intent. But yeah, we're good. I think I think we're good to end on this. Um, so thank you very much, Anne Elizabeth and Agnès for coming. It was a pleasure. Uh, you can... Agnès should do a conclusion. I think. 
Oh, vive, la, vive la République, vive la France! <laughs> vive la République, vive la France! That's a good conclusion. You can find Agnes's book, Notre Dame, a sort of Paris, and Left Bank, Art, Passion, and the Rebirth of Paris, 1940 1950, online. And thank you for both of you for coming, and you can check them on their social media where they uh, interact regularly. Well, uh, well that, was, that was another episode wrapped up, uh, the 11th. So, François, what did you think? I thought it was a fascinating episode because, um, you know, we're, we're all very concerned about what's happening in France. And the, I think the passion was really felt in the episode. And it, and it was great to get all these people to, to, to discuss this issue. Um, I, think, I think there's one thing we, we've noticed to a large extent is, especially towards the end, is the extent, at, you know, the extent of the influence of American culture on French politics. Um, that is that is a important realization because I, I like making this comparison. In many ways, France and the United States have the same relationship that France we used to have with with its colonies to some extent. It's a form of intellectual colonialism because just like the French Empire would um, would mold its colonies and shape the way the elites of uh, of these countries would think. What America is doing, it's getting the raw products, the raw intellectual products from France, you know, the Deleuze, the Derrida, the Foucault, that French theory that was imported uh, by the United States into their colleges. And from then it was repackaged and made into wokers and whatever you want to call it and sent back as a finished product, finished commercial product to France. Not only that is, you know, and to use the example of Orkaya Diallo, now they're also taking, taking our aspiring, our young generation, our future elites, they're taking them, they're shaping them, and then they're sending them back to the home country, to the, to, the, to, the, to the colonies where they will shape the discourse. And I think, I think that's something which has become increasingly apparent. And, and the, way, the way some of the American press has behaved um, with, with France, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of cultural imperialism creeping in. Now, to, I, I think there's a few people here who have been fairly criticized in this episode. I think I think what uh, Adam Nossiter said was was scandalous. Then there's other people who I think, you know, um, James McCauley, um, the Washington Post reporter, uh, correspondent, I think I think he's knowledgeable about France. I like what he writes, he's always smart. I disagree with most of it, but I think, you know, you can't you can't put him on the same same level as someone as Nossiter who is um, you know, the peak in hypocrisy and, and uh, unfair criticism. Absolutely. And, and with that, we uh, will see you in our next episode. Thanks so much for listening.